they think that they, they can give them probiotic bacteria that would allow them to like digest and like defend against these diarrhea-causing pathogens. And they can actually stop the diarrheal problem, which is a really large problem in the developing world, and it causes millions of deaths a year. Uh, further, they think that they can engineer like uh, microbe solutions to help people with obesity have more effective microbes that would help them digest more of the food that they're eating in a more effective way that could help reduce obesity. Um, you know, you can have pizza for every meal conceivably. If you wanted to fund this research, I mean, you could conceivably invent a microbe that's really good at just digesting the stuff that's in pizza. And you can like, not gain as much weight as you get from pizza. Uh, and you also eat all the cheese that you can ever want. Um, and so with that, I will leave you with Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Today is basically combined some of the microbes I already mentioned here to produce biofuel for us. So there's two microorganisms that we work in our lab to make this happen. One is one one is one that do the photosynthesis that I mentioned here, which you, which you would call microalgae. So the microalgae is like a, a plant that produces photosynthesis and it, can, uh, and it has carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Lipids is the fuel that we need. And basically, we use in our lab uh, bacteria that is in your book to help extract these lipids, which is a fuel we need. So, but why microalgae has been something that there's a good trend now? Um, why is the logic behind this? Basically, so fossil fuels, which is the main agent against uh, for the climate change issue, it has microalgae in plants has been fossilized for <coughs> geological time. So basically, you have the same fuel, but just in a renewable way. Uh, so if you see, like, if we compare microalgae with other plants that produce biodiesel, that's how much we can produce, uh, I don't know why I didn't show, okay, it's oil per root per acre, acre. So it's like 20 times more than one in the second place. So it's much more productive. You can produce much more in a smaller area. So, and then we can ask, but it's really possible we, we consume, especially here in the US, is consuming a huge amount of diesel. So it's possible to produce this amount in a renewable way to really replace it. So the Energy Information Administration, they estimate how much should be the potential using algae oil to replace the biodiesel. Turns out this, is, this red line here is how much diesel the US used today. So in this graph is how much we can produce from algae. So we can produce twice the amount of diesel that is used today to produce microalgae. So of course, it looks so great, so then we ask why you just don't do it, right? So the thing is like, it doesn't matter if it's just renewable, it has to be cheap enough, so no one's gonna buy you. You don't wanna pay like 10 bucks per gallon uh, for your gas. Right? So that's, and that's where come the research that we do. We're trying to make this efficient and cheap enough to be able to be renewable and competitive. So usually what they do is we grow this algae in algae ponds. So we can literally, that's another advantage is, so there's a lot of argument that they say uh, that producing biofuel is gonna take land that can be, can be used by, for food, right? Because with microalgae, you don't need that. You can create here in the middle of the desert. There's no arable land. You just have to be able to build your we call like photobioreactor, which is a box full of microalgae and water, or an algae pond. So it can go anywhere. Uh, so one of the greatest challenges is, so to be able to extract, so we grow the microalgae, but we have to extract from the side of the cell the lipids, which is the fuel that we need. And this is a very energy intensive process. So that's one of the expensive parts of the whole process. So usually what they do is they have to dry, so they have to separate the water, from the, the biomass, and that's a very energy intensive process. So we try to figure out a more efficient way to do that. So what some of the things we do at ASU is, so what if we, if we, if we don't need to take the water out of the microalgae? What if, if we can you know, extract the, the lipid, the fuel, directly from the water phase? And to be able to do that, we use microorganisms that are in the wastewater, or even you know, the same that are in your poop, to help to kill this algae, to 
break down the cell and release the liquid in the water phase. So, for example, here's a tank that you use uh, for a wastewater purpose. It gives the same reactor as a fermenter reactor to release the slippage in the liquid phase. So this is like a small reactor that I play at ASU uh, in my free time when I'm not a master Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is like an estimate <clears throat> that we have not done this estimate, it's been done for another study of economic perspective, how we're going to make this uh, cheap enough to be competitive. And he say, says that one of the things is we call wet extraction, which is the term that I just mentioned to extract the lipids from the water phase. And if we get around 50%, we can maybe get the price of the fuel really down. But we also have another challenge is the algae has to grow a lot faster than it usually is done now. In our lab, we are achieving this 50% already. So, but there's another challenge, is it's a complicated process, and you know, I can answer your questions. Um, and uh, that's it. And uh, so I'm not your only hope. I wish. <laughs> so, uh, but I, you know, I definitely, we definitely need more scientists. And maybe some of you guys want to become a scientist. That would be great to help us, or even investors or people to promote that, because we need to fight climate change and see. Before we get to questions, Shago brought some really cool flyers. There's a really awesome opportunity that you all have. So if you would like to have the microbial mapping of your gut, you can have that done for you for free uh, at ASU in the mic uh, microbiome analysis lab. So we have some flyers up here with the information of who you need to contact. And basically what you're going to have to do is sign a waiver that says, hey, I'm a healthy person and you can use my sample as a control in an experiment. <laughs> okay. you're, so you're going to be considered healthy individual. So your poop, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get back the information about what's in your poop <laughs> and, and the lab will use it. It will be completely anonymous, your poop in the study. No one <laughs> But your poop will go to good use. So the lab will use that to compare your poop to the poop of children that have autism because right now the lab is looking for links between uh, your digestive tract, microflora, and autistic symptoms and severity. Yes. So if you're interested in that, we have some flyers. Yes? I, I have an autism spectrum disorder. Can I, get, can I sign on the experimental group? Um, <laughs> That is a good question. So I would highly encourage you to come up and take a flyer and contact it. Uh, uh, this is Juan. Yeah, contact Juan, who is the person that's at the lab, and uh, ask, because that is a very real possibility, but I'm not sure. So send him an email and, and, and find out, yeah. So the flyers will be up here at the end if, if you want them. I'll, I'll, I'll remind everyone before you leave, if you would like to poop and know what bacteria are in there for free, Think of it like 23 and me. It's like a thousand dollar value, right? <laughs> okay, with the uh, now that I'm trying to steal your poop, we can open up to questions. Yeah, so I saw one back there. What is the what would I get back? What would it tell me on my micro? So this, uh, here. Right, see? That's my right there. Um, so what you're going to find out, uh, what I believe is what you're going to find out is they're going to take your poop, they're going to extract DNA, they're going to put it through a, a, a high throughput sequencer, so basically it's going to give like, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of reads of what microorganisms are in there, and then you're going to get a little bar graph that says, uh, I'm not sure at what level, maybe genus or, well genus might be, there might be a lot there, but, so <laughs> you'll, get a, you'll get a classification of the microorganisms that are alive in your gut, and then do what I do, which is go online and figure out what all those things might be doing, which would be really fascinating. Every time you poop? Uh, I, think, I don't think you have to give more than one donation, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you do? Google every time I poop, yeah. what the microbes are. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's only a matter of time before we get like automated toilets where you just poop in there and Next question. Yeah. Um, 
you were talking about microbes inside you that create, um, they excrete vitamins. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I think B12 was one of the ones that was on there. Mm -hmm. So if your doctor says you don't have enough B12, is it because your microbes aren't producing enough, or is it because you aren't ingesting enough? So the thing is, for microbes to make B12 and other vitamins, uh, they need to create these fatty acids from the carbohydrates that you ingest. Um, and so even though the, the bacteria inside you can produce B12, it is still a vitamin. It does pass through your body and doesn't stick around. So it can't make B12 unless your diet is giving it the material to eat B12. I wouldn't recommend just eating a bunch of fatty acids to do that. I would just you know, take a B12 pill or something. <laughs> Plus, I would add that it's also a uh, absorption problem, uh, mostly not a production sure. problem. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, a lot of people might say that we are losing, like, antibiotics and losing the war against microbes, or eventually will. How promising, in your opinion, how promising is uh, quorum sensing? I don't know if you guys are familiar with quorum sensing. Yeah. Um, how promising is that? Is it defense? <laughs> I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out what you're talking about because the way I understand quorum sensing, it wouldn't have anything to do with antibiotic resistance really. So it's the way that um, bacteria communicate. Right. Yeah. So you can, you know, they communicate. Uh, Sometimes by one bacteria, and then the more and more bacteria that there are, they actually send a signal to each other to attack at once, so that they can get a, a stronger uh, virulence. Um, well, I, I read oh. about um, research and form testing to replace antibiotics. Maybe. Yeah, I think that the research that you're talking about, because I do actually remember hearing about that, yeah. um, I think that the idea was that antibiotics traditionally attack single cells. Like they'll, they'll go after individual cells, like the cell membrane or cell that process in the cell. Um, I think that that article that you might have read was probably talking about like creating agents to like stop quorum sensing like metabolites. Like the, the way the quorum sensing works for people who don't know about it is basically bacteria will generate metabolites by just like simply existing like byproducts, and other bacteria can use these metabolites to like sense that there are other bacteria around. And once a certain threshold is reached, they'll be like, okay, let's change our behavior, let's like make a biofilm or something, or like it's all attack all at once, um, and let's like get a really good result. Uh, the approach that is being talked about is that instead of making antibiotics that target specific microbes, is that instead of doing that, let's get around the antibiotic resistance problem and make, metab like, make materials that bind to the quorum sensing metabolites themselves. And that would decrease the ability for quorum sensing behavior because they wouldn't be able to sense each other around each other. Um, I think it had some promise, but then again, given that most of our antibiotics are becoming resistant, uh, resistant against, but I think there's a lot more promise in just trying to engineer better antibiotics, in my own opinion. Yeah, I think the problem of antibiotic resistance is one where we need to attack it from many different strategies. But anyway, just to put that a different way, like the you might think of it as antibiotics or you know, in a war you're just trying to kill all of the enemy soldiers, but in this case they're just trying to disrupt the communication so that they can't effectively attack or form a biofilm or all these things like that. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry, you said the the percentage of our genome in our body was 67.7% viral. How much of that is in bacterial DNA? There's really no way to know that just because of the way sequencing works. So it's it's an interaction between your your cells, then the bacterial cells, and the viral cells, but then you have that other level where it's the bacterial cells that are in you also have viruses in them. So you might have a bacteria that's really, really bad for you, but at the same time there's a phage that's killing off that bacteria, so you never get any symptoms, and it's still there. So it's, it's interactions like that, and what I was saying is we don't know a lot of those interactions, even a little bit, so it's, it's sort of hard to determine what's going on at this point, because sequencing only tells us what's there, not what the interactions are. One, one case, and this is viral, I know this is a virus, I'm sorry about the misinformation here. Um, like, like what Brandon was talking about, about uh, when they reintroduced microbes to the guts of mice that had been completely sterile, they did a similar experience, uh, experiment sorry, with a virus. And what happened is when you keep sterile conditions in the gut, your cilia, which are the 
uh, cells that sort of move everything around in your gut, and then also, well, it moves mucus, and that also is responsible for most of the absorption of nutrients. They found that those would have a lot of developmental issues, but when you reintroduce this singular virus, it takes those cilia that are already having developmental issues and brings them to a point that's almost like natural cilia, and that's just one virus, and that's just one interaction. So there's a, there's a ton going on. It's just we have no idea what a lot of those are. This is a very new field that's just cropped up in the last you know, 10, 20 years, a year, but even just with the ongoing research now, but I think the reason it's so complicated is you have the role of just, you know, your intestines absorb stuff and digest stuff and secrete stuff to, you know, to break down food, but bacteria also do. The bacteria interact with your intestines. There are viruses that interact with the bacteria, and then there are viruses that also straight up interact with your cells too. So everything is interacting with everything else, and it creates a very complex system. And so we're only now just starting to unravel all of these different interactions. And, and I mean, we're, we're filled with viruses. Pretty much everyone in this room has uh, Epstein-Barr virus in them. I think it's like 96 or 8% of people who get sequenced for it have that in 